I'm Nana Fatalberg for Bez News. The South African National Defence Force has been accused by opposition parties of recklessly deploying soldiers for foreign missions after it emerged that two soldiers lost their lives and another three were injured when a mortar bomb landed inside one, one of their bases in the DRC where they are part of a peacekeeping force. 2,900 South African soldiers are currently fighting against M23 rebels in the country and reports have also also surfaced in recent days of an expired contract for SANDF for helicopter maintenance. To gain insights in what exactly is going on in the South African National Defence Force, we have Quibus Maria, the DA Shadow Minister for Defence and Military Veterans in the studio. Hi Quibus, uh, thanks so much for joining us. Good morning Linda, it's a privilege to be here. Well, the, a lot of issues are suddenly in the news about the South African Defence Force. What's going on there? Well, we, we know that over the last years, the um, Defence Force has seen a constant deterioration of defence capabilities, and specifically with regards to the availability and serviceability of their prime mission equipment. Now, um, I have submitted various questions, written questions, to which the Minister has responded, and obviously some others one has uh, have, uh, posed in the portfolio committees and the Joint Standing Committee on Defence, and obviously gain gain more information. Uh, additionally to that, I've always believed that you have to have your own um, reliable and reputable intelligence sources, uh, whether it's inside the Defence Force or outside in intellectual academia, experts, etc. So, so it's a culmination of things that we have seen happen over quite some time. And, um, you know, I have uh, identified that there are many reasons for that. Um, uh, overstretching of the uh, Defence Force capabilities and the, and the resources, uh, total underfunding of what they expect from government, uh, from, from the Defence Force, um, and then, in my opinion, a, a total misunderstanding by the political leaders of what you require for such Defence Force, and then... Uh, in, in further, a uh, lack of a political will to make the decisive decisions and the right decisions to correct this misaligned uh, uh, priorities and, and spending of defense budgets. So, so it is a culmination that has happened over years. And, uh, you know, one, one is seeing this, unfortunately, in the, in the circumstances that our soldiers came back in body bags, and ironically, about two days prior to the news of the of the death of the two soldiers, um, I have warned the, the president and the minister and say, you are reckless, you are irresponsible, you are sending our soldiers in to be returned home to their loved ones in body bags. And uh, unfortunately, I don't like to be correct in the circumstances, but unfortunately it is. But there's a long um, you know, a process that has been followed to where we are. Um, and yes, I mean, one can might go much deeper into into this whole thing about under budget overstretching. So what has the effect been on soldiers? So what don't they have? Don't we have the Royal Falk helicopter? What, 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 what kind of um, equipment do they need that they don't have? One must remember um, that the current South African National Defence Force is largely based on the old South African Defence Force, its prime mission equipment, uh, and you know added on uh, some of these um, ammunition that was bought um, under the so-called arms deal that has been in hold of a lot of controversy. Um, so those are our capabilities. So our Defence Force prime mission equipment is very old, very dilapidated. There's been a total underfunding of um, specifically for maintenance, for upgrades, for essential upgrades, for renewals, and for replacements. Um, in the 2015 Defence Review, which was announced as a revolutionary defence policy for South Africa, there was uh, they've, they've alluded and uh, expanded on all the ideal situations. And then in terms of spending the budget, 40% is supposed to be spent on cost of employees, 
30% on, on training and deployments and 30% on maintenance, upgrades, um, um, improvements and replacements. Now, we know over the last couple of years, with the over-commitment of Defence Force, whether it is abroad or inside South Africa, um, we are spending over 70% on cost of employees. And with the um, nearly unvetted deployment of soldiers, whether inside or outside South Africa, most of the other 30% are taken up by deployment costs. Uh, it means that there are they, they are compromising on training costs and then mostly on, on prime mission equipment, maintenance, upgrades, and replacements. That means that our, our, our prime mission equipment is 40 years old, 60 years old. They are even one up to 80 years old. Um, and, and our newest prime mission equipment comes from the, from the arms deal, which is now about 20, over 20 years old. So, and, and if you don't invest in your prime mission equipment, then you've got a problem. Now, in this specific case of the DRC, we have, we, we have been there since 2013. The United Nations have been there uh, for the last 20 years. So, um, and we have had experience with the M22 rebels just shortly after 2013, when um, we were extremely successful in defeating them to a large extent because of the involvement of the of the Rayfart helicopter, which was at that stage highly advanced, uh, one of the best in the world. Um, and I mean, we, we urgently need an upgrade of the Rayfart uh, up to a Mark II version, and then obviously upgrading of technology and radar systems, um, ammunition systems, weapon systems, etc. The other thing is, is that... Um, at that stage, we also had the availability of five Oryx helicopters, transport helicopters, logistical helicopters, that is essential for medivacs, for evacuations, for transport of, of uh, soldiers in and out where they need to be, uh, ammunition, you know, replenishment of ammunition, food, etc. And And up till not long ago, whenever there was a a flight to be flown into a, 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 a red zone, a hotspot zone. It was always two Oryx helicopters to support each other, also in the case where, you know, they, 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 they need to um, evacuate from the one. Um, and then they were normally escorted by at least, at least two Rayford attack helicopters. Now, the Rayford attack helicopter's purpose is not only to shoot whenever... There, as uh, you know, there are fires on, or, or, or when the enemy or the adversary shoot to us, but it's also a deterrent because they know very well the capabilities of the rifle, and they know very well that should they be identified, they will probably lose their lives. So, so we were very successful in that regard. Unfortunately, over a number of years, we have seen less and less money being spent. To, to maintenance, to the extent we we have got a situation now that the Oryx, oh, that, that first of all the Rayfog that is still in the DRC uh, for the last year, year and a half has been grounded, so there are nobody to fly it. It hasn't flown. I think there's one probably of 16 squadron in South Africa where pilot training is taking place uh, that is still flying. That is of the 11 of total that we have got. Now on the on the Oryx helicopters, we know that they are incredibly capable and they are incredibly essential for South African Defence Force, not only in the DRC, Mozambique, but also here on borderlines and in training. It is essential um, for especially our airborne infantry units, obviously our parabats and our special forces, etc., now, of the 39 Oryx helicopters, we probably have got about four available, and that's been in answers from the minister to us. Um, we have got um, one in, in uh, Mozambique, which is not adequate. And then at the moment of the Oryx in the DRC, we had the two available, but we know that we have lost the one about two weeks ago when, when the pilot was shot and the, and the medic was, was, was wounded. 
Um, so we have lost that one. So at the moment, we have got one Oryx available who is anyway due for a major service back in South Africa. Um, and we will maybe talk about, you know, this contracts. And because of that, there's a major problem with that. So in other words, our capabilities to support our soldiers are incredibly poor and of a, 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 actually a dire situation. Uh, and that's why the emphasis is on irresponsible and irrational and, 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 and really dangerous for the lives of, of uh, our soldiers. Now, this specifically refers to this Operation Kiba, uh, which is the 2,900 soldiers. Now, as I've said, remember, we have been there since 2013 as part of the MONUSCO forces, our Operation Mistral, um, and we know that the United Nations, first of all, has decided to withdraw from the DRC, and then secondly, the president of the DRC has requested them to even try to leave earlier. Uh, I know that his intention is to leave um, by middle of this year, while, while the, the, the contract period is actually until the end of this year. So, so um, you know, that posed the question of, of where do we stand? Remember, finances and our budget, and I will get to that, of the Defence Force is critically important. But up till now, from the United Nations, um, our costs were about 1 billion rand per year, and we have been recovered from the United Nations between 450 million and 750 million rand per year, and that was based on the serviceability of our equipment. Now, uh, and that was already very difficult to support our soldiers logistically, especially logistically, because, you know, we, are, we have got one C-130 uh, that most of the times also struggle to be in the air, and otherwise we must uh, charter, uh, you know, these international um, cargo aircrafts at, at hundreds of millions of rands, uh, which has become unaffordable. So, so, so how do we then do this? Um, remember, when it's a SADC deployment, although they have promised us that the taxpayer will not foot the bill. I have, I have yet to be to see any refunds from the SADC specifically for this purpose, for the, for, for the employment of the soldiers. That has not happened in, the, in, the, in Mozambique where we were promised. And now we were very concerned, where is this 2 billion rands going to come from to, to support this 2,900 soldiers? Now, I believe at the at Cape Town Press Club, when the president was Ask about that. Um, he he said, "No, our soldiers have all the support and all the equipment and all the resources." But yesterday, to, um, Wednesday morning, yesterday, in our portfolio committee on defence, where we talked about the third quarter report and the B Triple R uh, feedback report from the Department of Defence, uh, I've specifically asked the Secretary of Defence, "Do we have that two billion rand? Where is it going to come from?" And she has confirmed at this stage it's unfunded. Now, we know what happened yesterday in the budget as well. There's been no money for that specifically. Uh, in fact, the, the defense budget is in real terms lower than what the amended budget, uh, um, uh, you know, towards the end of last year was. So, so where the money is going to come from at this stage, we know it's unfunded. That means that there's again going to be um, uh, compromises. Now, the cost of employees will be incredibly high. Our, our budget for the use of reserve force was at 1.9 million uh, man days. After the third quarter, it was already at 2.6 million man days, and that was prior to, to the uh, Operation TIBA, to the DRC. So you can expect the, the eventual man days of the reserve force to be closer to 3.5, 3.6 million mandates, which has got a direct impact on cost of employees, which means that that will go well above the 7%. And that means there's only one place that they can cut costs, and that again is on prime mission equipment. We have seen there's lower, lower provisions for, for, for Air Force and specifically uh, helicopters, uh, and obviously the Navy. I don't even want to touch about the Navy, but because that is a, a total mess, and at this stage, we are going fast, so so fast down the down the tubes that it is 
it's really concerning and sometimes I find it difficult to sleep at night. So you talked about the money needed to maintain um, the equipment and the attack helicopters and everything. So what is the issue at the moment with Danel not being paid for maintenance of helicopters? One must remember that Danel is the original uh, uh, equipment manufacturer for specifically the, the Rayfalk and for the Oryx helicopters. So as an OEM, there are specifically uh, benefits and rights and obligations that they will maintain and will keep over some time. Um, and, and, and for that, uh, and for whatever the reason is, they have, they have agreed some years ago about a payment structure between Arms Corps, uh, the Defence Force on the one side, and the NEL on the other side, specifically with the maintenance and the upgrade and the availability of technicians and engineers to, to, sure that, to make sure that all our prime mission equipment is in, is in a, a readily, um, uh, you know, deployable state. Now, we know that currently there's about over 20 of our Oryx helicopters are at uh, Danel Aeronautics. And because of the so-called PSS contracts between the, the the South African Air Force and the NEL that is not in place, obviously they don't get certain monies to invest in people and in spare parts and making provisions for that. It means that it's at a dead standstill. So there is a bit of a conflict between, on the one side, the South African Air Force, who actually, in my opinion, want to take the NEL out of the, out of the equation, uh, but on the other hand, the NEL see that as their lifeline, and as, because they are the OEM, they obviously refuse to barge on that. So, so because of that contract, uh, there are certain things that the that the Oryx squadrons can do for minor maintenance. But the moment that they talk about major issues and major repairs and major replacements, you know, we are at a at a deadlock. And as long as that is Pro- progressing and going on, we will we will keep on having these problems, and the same applies to the Red Force. Uh, obviously, from a political point of view, it doesn't make sense. The commander in chief is is in charge of all his, his cabinet members, and and you have got the Department of Defense on the one side, and the Department of Public uh, State and Enterprises, Minister Pravin Kordan on the other side, and National Treasury, and it seems like they can't find each other. On this very very important thing, so uh, so I think it's just it, it just doesn't make sense, and, and that's why I've referenced um, you know the lack of a political will, will right in the beginning. My information is that yesterday, when the minister of defence um, was present, when the, uh, the you know the bodies of the deceased were handed over to the families at Air Force Base Watergrove, uh, she was asked by a a journalist about the funding uh, for the operation. And my information is how her answer was after, you know, quite a time of not responding, saying that's a question that the journalist must pose to the Minister of Finance and National Treasury. Now, now that indicates to you that, you know, who's in charge, who authorized the, the deployment of soldiers, what are the conditions that they set for that, um, and, and remember, the, the president has, has said that they are, they've got all the resources, and we know for a fact they do not have that. Um, and, and that, in our opinion, is part of why we say it's irresponsible, it is illogical, and it is very, very dangerous. My opinion is, if uh, uh, I was the Minister of Defense and I would advise my leader or my president, I would say, what? are the national interest of South Africa in the Eastern DRC. We have got a national interest in the DRC, but it's predominantly around Kinshasa and to the West Coast. Um, why is it the responsibility of South Africa as the most southern member of SADC to rescue the most northern member of SADC, the DRC, and specifically the Eastern DRC, when it is actually a conflict within the East African community bloc. It is conflict between Rwanda and, and the DRC, and there are even rumors of support from 
uh, of saying from other neighboring countries to other rebel groups. So in other words, where's Uganda? Where's Burundi? Where's Kenya? There's a little bit of support from Tanzania and Malawi. Where is Zambia? Where is Angola? So none of them see this as a real threat and a nas- of their national interest. So why is it to South Africa? Why must we be the savior? So, And I also said that this is not a SADC operation, although the president claimed it to be. It's actually predominantly South Africa with a little bit of support from Tanzania and even less from Malawi. Okay, um, well, we, which brings me to the next question. Um, I've spoken to Muleti Mbeke yesterday, and he was saying that while we're doing this, you know, involved in Mozambique, because um, we haven't even discussed Mozambique, and devol- involved in the DRC, our borders are unprotected. And he posed the question, what stops a, you know, one of these M23 rebels, because they supported by Rwanda, what stops one of them coming into our country and, and and launching an attack? So is it true? Is our borders unguarded? It is. It is unfortunately very true. Um, we have got 15 companies um, deployed on our most northern borders. Um, that's, you know, uh, Northern Cape, uh, Northwest, Limpopo, Mutumalanga, and the north of, of KwaZulu-Natal. But that's only 15 companies, and they're mainly doing food patrols. So without the necessary high technology support where you can, where you can actually do reconnaissance on a 24-7 basis and then have a rapid response forces you know, being sent out, you actually have got no control. Uh, I have seen myself on certain radar technology that we do not use, but that is available in South Africa, how you can actually see the people walking across the border once the South African patrol has, has passed that specific point. So, so yes, our borders are porous, and then I even, even touched on our maritime border. With the, with the increased maritime traffic now around the Cape, um, you know, sub, subsequent to the problems in the Red Sea uh, and, and, and the Suez Canal, it has increased enormously, you know, the risk involved for South Africa. So, and that is part of what I say is withdraw the troops in from the DRC, um, regroup, retrain, uh, re-equip, upgrade our our prime mission equipment, make sure that we have got naval vessels on on the land uh, on the maritime area, make sure that our our most essential air platforms, because remember the minister has confirmed. 85% at least of all our platforms are grounded due to maintenance upgrades and, and, and budgetary constraints. They've reported yesterday on what the, the guys in the uh, Air Force will understand about, about um, uh, 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 their currencies. Now, the currencies, for those who understand that, are a major concern because you might have pilots, but if their currencies are not up to date, they cannot fly. In other words, they are not their competencies levels hasn't been certified for certain flights to be done. Uh, and if you cut the budget and they can't fly, uh, and that is, I think, what Mr. M- Mr. Moretzin Beke has, has also referred to, um, uh, then you actually force them, you know, to, to retire or to, or to resign and, and, and practice their passion somewhere else where they can fly and where the money is available for that. So, yes, we have got enormous porous borders. And if we... And remember, Mozambique is, is of, in my opinion, a much higher priority and an importance than a country far away that is not of national interest. The, uh, Mozambique has got enormous liquid natural gas resources and other minerals and oil, and we can directly benefit from those na- liquid natural gas resources um, to especially Gauteng. And it is so easy. For, for those rebels and others, uh, bad actors, to easily flow over our borders into our country. We know it already exists. I don't want to, uh, you know, uh, uh, cry foul, uh, but it already exists. We, we know that there are, uh, you know, Muslim Brotherhood cells in South Africa. We know that we are already been on, on, put on the gray list due to doubts whether, you know, we are uh, channeling or laundering money for the purpose to Hamas and others. Um, so it is a real threat, and that is part of where we should reprioritize 
a defense budget and, and spending uh, towards where it is most needed based on the mandate in the current constitution and what is in the best interest of our people in South Africa. Sure. So well, what we're actually saying is they spread thin on the ground. They shouldn't be fighting in, in the DRC. They should prioritize our borders and Mozambique. Is that what you, in summary, would say? Absolutely. And, and remember, there's also this appetite to deploy the soldiers inside South Africa when there's a failure in other governments' departments. Mostly the police, but now ESCOM as well, and even with regards to the illegal mining. Now, if you look at the number of people being deployed already, then you see that we are facing a huge problem and a challenge with regards to the human resources. Keep in mind how you, how you normally operate, because all of the current commitments will require a maximum of around about 12, just over 12,000 soldiers at any time. But when you do those, those deployments, there's always one group deployed, one group, group back at home, one group preparing to be deployed. So you must actually multiply that by three. And then when you compare that with what we have got available, then you will see that we haven't got even half of that available on a regular basis from our infantry and other support uh, formations. And that is why we have to rely so heavily on, a, on our reserve force. But in the meantime, our reserve force is aging and there is not rejuvenation uh, of our reserve forces, but also not of our regular forces. Now, you can tell me anything if you want me to go and be deployed. And I admit that, that that will be the biggest mistake because that will be, you know, sort of like sending in, you know, a guys from the old Sadev that is currently in the old age home and, and give a, a R1 rifle in their hand and then you will see what a mess they are making. And that is basically what is happening. Thank you so much for speaking to us. It is an absolute pleasure and uh, it's the first time that I'm speaking to you and it's been on my bucket list so now I can tick that off again. Oh, thank well. you so much. <laughs> <laughs>